Hello, and welcome to another edition of Inventor's Quick Tips. In this episode, we are going to look at ecosystem inventions and talk about what makes them different from other inventions. And to do this, we'll be focusing on a case study pertaining to digital television. So in our example, we'll be discussing the Panasonic TU-DST50W, one of the first commercially available over-the-air high-definition products you could buy. And it has an interesting story that we'll get into in a bit and see how it participated in its ecosystem. So let's give a brief history on it. It was introduced around 1999. It cost around $2,000 retail at that time, which would be around $3,600 in today's money. And after you shelled out two grand for this box, you weren't done. You needed something to watch it on, and at that time, a high-definition monitor could cost anywhere between $2,000 and $10,000. It used an antenna to pick up over-the-air high-definition broadcasts using an 8VSB tuner. And today, it's really hard to believe, but the software running in this box could not be upgraded in the field. There was no mechanism to download a software update like we do today with our phones and even our cars. The only way you could ever update this was to open it up and swap out chips that look something like this. So you could spend all that money, and if there was any software bug, you were probably going to have to live with it. Let's take a quick rundown of the back panel in order to see what it has. You have a coax connector for an antenna, and of course, the product was marked as patent pending. That is a common practice if selling a product that has patent applications that were applied for pertaining to it. It had this output mode switch, which gave you three choices. The choice on the left was basically a native format. Whatever format the broadcast was is what got output. So 1080i video sources were output as 1080i. 720p video sources were output as 720p, and so on. The middle setting took 1080i and output that as 1080i. And anything that wasn't 1080i, including 720p, was down converted to 480p. And the setting on the right down converted everything to 480p. Note that quite a few of the high definition televisions of this era had a max resolution of 720p. So you were kind of out of luck if you had one of those televisions to use with this box, as most of the content would be down converted to 480p, and though it may still look better than what you may have been used to in 1999, it was not the high def content you were paying for. Now let's take a look at the digital interfaces, of which it had two. It had an optical audio output to connect an audio receiver for surround sound, and it had this digital interface port, which is a 1394 port, also known as Firewire. It had a purpose of connecting to a digital VHS recorder, because you could not record digital programming with a conventional VCR that was popular when this product was introduced. Panasonic, along with other manufacturers, made digital VCRs that connected via this interface. They never really did take off because hard disk recording came along and obsoleted them soon after their introduction. They lost their window. And if you are curious, I have another video that talks a bit about digital VCRs, and I will put a link to that video in the description. It had a bunch of RCA connections for video. There was no HDMI at this time, so you needed five separate cables, two for audio and three for the video. Additionally, there was S-Video and Composite Video to work with the standard definition televisions of the time, a phone number to call for help if you needed it. Today, there would likely be a website instead of or in addition to a phone number. Back in 1999, although the Internet existed, putting websites on product labels was not very common. Of course, the product was marked with relevant patents. It is not unusual today to simply put a sticker with a link to a website that lists all the patents rather than listing all the numbers directly on the sticker. But as I mentioned, that was not a common practice in 1999. So now that we gave the intro to the set-top, let's see what the ecosystem looks like. We have the set-top box that we just talked about. We need a monitor. We need an antenna that has to receive radio waves from a broadcaster antenna, 
and that broadcaster needs to have high definition content to broadcast. Without all these things, none of it's going to work. Now, I'm going to connect this thing and see if, after more than two decades, it can fire up. Luckily for me, I have an old TV because many newer TVs don't come with the component inputs that you would need to connect this set-top box. So here's the unit I got from eBay for a mere fraction of its original price. I hooked up a cheap rabbit ears antenna. Then I got my five cables. Like I had mentioned, no HDMI in 1999. And it kinda sorta tried to work. The antenna was very sensitive and after experimenting I realized I needed to have the antenna propped at an exact angle. And then I got a pretty solid picture with a quality on par with cable, satellite, or streaming. The user interface was a little bit bizarre. They had this roller guide that you spin to get to different options. And as an example, here is the option for the digital VHS recorder. You can see it would let you control the recording and playback. And overall, this device was quite advanced for its time and does still somewhat function today, even after over 20 years which is pretty amazing for a piece of digital telecommunications equipment. Okay, and here is another interesting fact about the Panasonic set-top in the channel banner it displayed. It gave you the virtual channel number. Back in the pre-digital age, people knew channels by their number. For example, the broadcaster ABC might be channel 6, where channel 6 pertained to the channel number used for analog broadcasts in a particular viewing area. Now that things were going digital, a different set of channels was used. For example, the channel for high-definition ABC might be 55, but the broadcasters wanted to continue to be identified by the analog channel number, so a virtual channel number system was implemented. Unlike analog programs, digital programs could carry multiple video streams, so you could actually get multiple programs per channel. Here we see it is tuned to the fourth program in the channel. And here we have the channel name. This data came from a standard called PSIP, which stands for Program Specific Information Protocol. This was something added to the product last minute, just before the TU-DST-50W was finalized. Recall that the software in this box is not easily upgradable. So if the PSIP feature didn't get implemented before production, it would probably never get the feature. So let's go back to the ecosystem. At the heart of it, we have an encoder from a broadcaster that makes encoded content. It was MPEG-2 video, to be specific, and that had to be decoded by a decoder in the set-top box. And fun fact, the image you see here is from the movie 101 Dalmatians, and that was actually the first broadcast that this model received from an actual television station. The engineering team was using internal video feeds in their lab when they got a call from the local ABC affiliate that they were going to broadcast a movie as a test. And that movie was 101 Dalmatians. The engineers convened in the lab that evening to observe the performance of the set-top box from a real broadcast sometime around 1998. Word got out that this set-top box product was in development and broadcasters were clamoring to buy one, borrow one, it could be a prototype, they didn't care. They were eager to have something to use to test all their broadcast equipment. It was an extraordinary opportunity for Panasonic. If Panasonic was able to get all their decoders to the makers and users of the encoders, then they had the opportunity to become the gold standard in MPEG decoding. By being first, encoder manufacturers and broadcasters would use it as the de facto standard, potentially making Panasonic a leader in North America's digital TV market. Unfortunately, Panasonic wasn't really interested in selling or loaning out prototypes. After years of leadership in analog TV, they had a certain way of doing things. Analog TV had an ecosystem too, but the analog TV ecosystem was established and hadn't really changed in decades. In 1999, the digital television ecosystem was new and being an early entry could have paved the way for new opportunities and market share. Unfortunately, 
Panasonic didn't capitalize on it the best way they could have. And it's easy with the benefit of 20 plus years of hindsight to see it as a mistake. But at the time, it was probably just a conservative, risk averse business culture. But that brings us to our summary of ecosystem inventions. So let's recap. With an ecosystem invention, no single component operates in a vacuum. The systems have to work together. A cell phone, regardless of brand, has to work with the carrier's cell phone towers. The video decoders have to work with the video encoders and the video monitors and so on. And that's why, in an ecosystem invention, being early can make a difference. When you establish yourself as a de facto standard device, a golden device that everybody wants to test against for interoperability, that can put the company in a good position to become a major player in the space of that ecosystem. Finally, even with standards and specifications, there is always room for interpretation and innovation. While standards spell out a lot of the rules about how devices interact, there are always some details that are left vague or not covered at all. And that's where the contribution of innovators can really come into play with an ecosystem type of invention. So hopefully you found this video interesting. If so, please like, share, and subscribe. And thanks again for watching.